So recently I saw a video by a YouTuber called Theo, called Why I Don't Unit Test. I'll put a link down in the description. It was a, quite a passionate argument about why um, he thought unit testing was a waste of time. And uh, as someone who thinks unit testing is very much worthwhile doing, I want to take the opportunity to go through his arguments, go through his video, offer my own counter arguments, and see what everyone else thinks is the right way to go. All right, I'll start the video. Let's talk about unit tests and why I don't use them. I know that's a bold statement, but I don't have much a use case for unit tests in the vast, vast majority of the things that I built. And I think that when I say that, my take gets seen as some crazy rebellious person who only works on small teams and is more than happy to go break things for all five of my users. I think if someone doesn't unit test, it doesn't mean they're rebellious. I think it just means they really enjoy spending time debugging. But this is actually the same take that, funny enough, some other big companies have. One of my favorites, and I need to go find the tweet quick. Quote tweeted it because it was really good. Aha. Here, I wanted to go find this tweet because as I said, it's a banger. Somebody went on a rant about like eng culture coming from one company to another and a Facebook engineer had a test that was preventing a change from happening. So he deleted the test and got back to work because tests are only there to block engineers. That is the only role of tests. I mean, a lot of things are there to block engineers, you know, syntax checking, type checking. I mean, I don't necessarily think being extremely permissive is the way to go. I think sometimes it's okay to block. And in this engineer's five years at Facebook, they have never written a single test. Yep, I've used Facebook. I believe it. It was cheaper to test and prod and forward fix. What you need to know is that it wasn't a 0 to 100% of infra in one day. It was tiered, monitored, with an SRE uh, team watching as things go out. Unit tests are designed to slow you down. Look, I, I feel like uh, I hear this argument a lot, like, um, oh, big tech company X does this. Let's do what they do. Here's the thing. Facebook is not successful because they have a great app. Facebook is successful because... They had a, an idea that went viral, sort of natural inbuilt viral marketing in a social network that blew up. They had fantastic infrastructure, resources to deal with anything that comes up. That's why they're successful. They're not successful because of their testing practices or lack thereof. So I think the emperor has, has no clothes here. And as for unit tests sort of being there to slow the developer down, I, I feel like <clears throat> debugging's a lot slower. If you don't have unit tests, fixing things in production is a lot slower than, than dealing with unit tests. And end-to-end -end tests are a lot slower than unit tests. So in my experience, unit tests, if you do them right, will speed you up. They won't slow you down. That is not necessarily a bad thing. There are a lot of places where slowing your engineers down to make sure everything is always <clears throat> the exact way you expect can make sense. Like if you're doing like financial bank software to make sure transactions are being processed correctly on the back end, those types of things should probably have unit tests as well as a shitload of integration end to end tests. That all said, if you're building applications for users, the application breaking slightly and then being fixed when you've identified that break is almost always cheaper. And if it's not cheaper, that's the thing you should be focused on fixing. I've helped a lot of teams this is very strange to me that you should be focused on fixing bugs once a user has found them. I mean, in my experience, users don't relish sort of being an unpaid quality control team. You know, a few users will sort of dutifully report a bug. I think the vast majority will sort of say, ah, oh, this app isn't ready and they're just going to move on. But let's hear what he has to say companies, individual engineers, find ways to be more productive without being more destructive, to be frank. And the best ways 
don't tend to be testing at all. And if they are, they're integration into end testing. Unit testing is a way to set up a guardrail at every possible turn when developers are the ones whose job is to make the path. Okay, our jobs are to make the path, but what's wrong with having guardrails on your path? <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll carry on with this analogy, see where he's going with this. You cannot predict every path somebody might go down, so your unit tests are going to block important paths inherently just by existing. Okay, but you can change tests. That's like saying, you know, you build a road and there's there's guardrails preventing cars going off a, <clears throat> a cliff or a mountainside. And you say, oh, but maybe this path isn't optimal. Maybe you want to change where the road goes. Cool. And then you move the guardrails. You don't just sort of rely on the cars to do the right thing and watch them pile into the bottom of a gully or something. But we'll carry on. I don't think senior developers, engineer leads, team leads, all of the people who make these technical decisions, certainly not like CTOs and such, should be enforcing code coverage numbers for unit tests because that is enforcing people to build guardrails instead of building paths. And if a path isn't put in the right place and somebody missteps and falls, you should be focused on building a good safety net. I don't know where this guy walks or where he drives, but um, I'm really glad that there's guardrails in real life and I'm not constantly falling into safety nets or driving into them. Um, so I disagree with him. I think guardrails are a lot better than safety nets. And I think that's the core of my testing philosophy. Don't build guardrails, build safety nets. Make it as cheap as possible to fail. So if something does go wrong in prod, you can revert it really quickly and fix it even quicker. He says, make it as cheap as possible to fail, but the cheapest place to fail is before you deploy it. That's what testing and high test coverage is all about. The cheapest place to fail is before it gets into users' hands. Our time to respond to a bug at ping, like when somebody reports an issue to us, our average response time is a decent bit under seven minutes for a production fix because we have optimized the hell out of our pipe so once an issue is reported to us, we can identify it fast and fix it even faster. Seven minutes is a very impressive time. Um, kind of sounds like it would really suck to work there, to be honest. If, if you're a software developer, if you're a programmer, do you want to be expected uh, to fix bugs in under seven minutes in production? I mean, do you want to be called up to fix a bug in, in seven minutes uh, That that's in production? I don't. I don't think most developers do around the world. I think we really want to prevent bugs getting into production in the first place. And I really think prevention is better than the cure here. So I'm pro guardrails. I'm anti safety nets, as he defines it. That is so much more important than any number of unit tests can be. And it doesn't cost our engineers more. In fact, the things that we did to make it that fast help our engineers every day on anything that they're working on. The value of not unit testing is that the time you would spend unit testing can be spent doing all of the other things our teams, our users, and our engineers want and need. And by making our environment as fast as possible. The time spent not unit testing, you can do things that your users and engineers want and need. I don't think your engineers want and need to fix bugs in production in under seven minutes. <laughs> I don't think your users want to encounter bugs in production. I feel like um, he's decided that testing is too hard or that making things testable is too hard or that architecting things to be testable is too hard and he's just given up. And I don't think that's the right approach. Well, it is now safer to make mistakes, but more importantly, our engineers are less scared. They don't worry about writing the right number of tests or when a test is failing for some reason, they don't worry about like deleting it and finding the right conditions. No, they worry about getting an email or a phone call late at night to fix a bug in production in under seven minutes. That's probably what's really worrying them. Tests are poorly placed guardrails. Please build safety nets instead. It isn't, it, it, I've seen so many code bases Okay, I, I really dislike the safety rails and guardrail analogy. And maybe it feels like a bit mean for me to pile in on this analogy, but I don't think it's a good one. And this guy's a smart dude, and I think he can come up with a better one. Because, look, <clears throat> um, guardrails and safety nets. Hey, don't have aircraft, commercial aircraft, uh, meticulously follow a flight path. 
uh, just make the inflatable vests really good and and do that instead. You know, uh, because flight paths change and who knows what happens. I don't think this analogy is good, and um, I don't think I don't think this focusing on men out to fix bugs in production is good. I think I think the tail is wagging the dog here. By like a ten person team that take twenty minutes to deploy and have eighty to ninety to hundred percent even code coverage, and that does not make a productive work environment. No, look, sure. Okay, you could do tests badly. You can do them slowly. I'm not denying that. I'm not saying tests are magically going to be good. They can be a pain. They can accumulate. Um, but what I'm arguing against is that the solution to that is just to give up and not do tests in the first place. Like, if I didn't do everything that I've seen done badly in the industry, like if I see something done badly in the industry, my reaction isn't, oh, that thing that they're trying to do is, is not worthwhile doing. My reaction is they're not doing a good job at it. Like, if you're not going to write tests because you've seen code bases where tests are a problem, why don't we just not write code either? Because I've seen a lot of code bases where code is the problem. I mean, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I've seen four-person teams hiring DevOps because they have dug themselves into such deep holes instead of keeping things simple. And unit tests are one of those things where if they're not solving a specific problem for you, probably shouldn't be writing them at all i agree if you're if you have useless tests useless unit tests get rid of them by all means if they're tested higher up and the coverage is good uh, why keep ones at the lower level if if you don't feel you need them sure i agree so i hope that helps people better understand my stance on unit testing and why i don't really bother doing it i've been we've been keeping track at ping actually we have a list of the bugs that hit production that a unit test theoretically could have caught and in our year of operation we're at three and of those three two of them absolutely we never would have written the test for they were very strange edge cases that were like maybe an integration test might have caught but like theoretically we could have written a unit test that caught those things but the reality is the problems we run into are not ones that unit tests realistically would have been testing for. i mean he, he's claiming that tests sort of wouldn't have caught the bugs he found but it's hard to say either way um, without knowing the specifics. So we'll, we'll take his word on this, right? Maybe, maybe he has a point. Four. On top of that, a lot of the problems I used to have that unit tests helped for were things that TypeScript has solved. So for the 80%... Whoa, okay, okay. What? TypeScript... TypeScript isn't solving the same things that unit tests are solving. Is he going to go into the static typing means I don't need tests thing? Hang on. Window of tests making sure valid inputs and outputs are happening. TypeScript does that. And for the other 20%, I feel like you're going to run into those bugs anyways. Okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no. Tests are not for making sure valid inputs and outputs. Ha tests are not like a, a replacement for static type checking or something that you do when you don't have a static type checker. They're not a replacement for a design by contract. Tests are little mini examples, little mini facts that you write about your code that you're able to machine verify. Whether you have dynamic typing or static typing doesn't change the fact. You certainly shouldn't be testing every single possible input of a dynamic type in a test. And I realize, you know, that people will say, well, static typing guarantees that you can't get a certain type of thing in a, in, a, in a function, in a unit, in a whatever, right? I agree. At the same time, whether it's static or dynamic typing, you should be narrowing the set of inputs that can get into your system at the boundaries of your system. You shouldn't be doing silly things, which I think is what he's been doing, of, of having some function deep inside your, your business logic that, I don't know, adds two numbers, and you're like, oh, but what if an, a null gets passed in, or what if an empty array or a jpeg or an audio file gets passed into my adding function i better test it otherwise you know it's not no that's not what you do you you test realistic edge cases and you you validate the input at the boundaries of your system whether it's statically type checked or not typescript won't save you from having to validate boundaries at the edge of your system because typescript only exists at compile time so making it easy to fix them when you do is way higher a priority for me almost always but theo we have this one path in our code base that's super fragile and it keeps breaking. So we have lots of unit tests making sure it doesn't break. Cool, I guess. 
Like if nobody ever wants to touch that and you've put those unit tests in to kind of like cement it in, in stone so that no one will ever touch it again. Great. You did your job. You took this thing that barely works and you t duct taped and cemented it in place so it can't ever move. So it's less likely to break. But I would have spent that time rebuilding the thing, not covering it in cement so it can't ever move again. How are you going to verify <clears throat> that the thing you rebuilt works if you've got rid of all of, of, of all of those annoying tests? That's what the tests are for. And look, I, 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 I get what he's saying. There are <clears throat> times where there are too many tests or they're testing the wrong thing or they're at too low a level and they sort of, you know, there's tests above it that kind of handle that case. But at the same time, like his strategy of just rewriting it and kind of hoping for the best and throwing it out in production and getting his team to respond in under seven minutes. I mean, that's not a great approach either tests are there so you can rewrite quickly and verify that your assumptions about the code base still hold true if your assumptions about the code base still hold true uh sorry if your assumptions about the code base have changed rewrite your tests to reflect your new assumptions and then test your code against that it, it's really simple tests should not lock you into place like if something is fragile the time spent reinforcing it with unit tests to double or more the amount of code just to make sure that thing doesn't break again. It's time you could almost always have spent rewriting the thing so it's less fragile in the first place. Uh, again, I'm confused by this. A test exists independently from the messy bit of code. The tests are assertions about the messy bit of code. And if you want to clean up that code and make sure these assertions still hold, um, then the way to do that is to run the test. So either the test's are useful or they're not. And if you're locking the code into place with a lot of tests, you need to determine are the tests valid? Or am I wasting my time? And if you're wasting your time, then get rid of the test. But pretending you can just replace things willy-nilly in a, in a code base, especially a legacy code base, with no test and it's going to be fine is incredibly naive to me. So, with all that said, I hope you understand why in the hierarchy of things I could be doing as an engineer, as a team lead, and as a CEO at any given time, unit tests don't even make the list. It does not bring value to our engineers, it does not bring value to our users, and it certainly does not bring value to our company. And you have to be in a very specific company's role for those things to matter a lot. Okay, I'm going <clears> to <throat> finish it up here. The conclusion I'm coming to here is that this guy's never seen a good test in his life. The fact that he thinks um, tests should replace static type checking, or that he doesn't need tests because of static type checking, to me suggests like he doesn't understand what testing is all about. You know, people test in statically typed languages all the time. You know, C Sharp has something unit, I can't remember, end unit. You know, Haskell has quick check. I mean, you can't come up with much more restricted type system than Haskell, and even they believe, or at least, you know, a big part of the community believes in the value of testing. Tests work on real life live code to tell you what actually happens in runtime. Static type checking is a form of static analysis that looks in your code without running it. I'm not saying it's not valuable, I'm just saying it's doing a different thing than testing is doing. And look, you have to pay the piper one way or the other. You either have um, a lot of automated tests and you have much less manual testing, or you replace your automated tests with a lot of manual testing, including unpaid manual testing for your customers that have to tell you about the bugs in production. Um, the total amount of testing is, you know, for a reliable piece of software is conserved. It's about whether you, it's about whether you want to get it done before you send it out or whether, whether you want to let your users find it. And I'll just finish up by saying, <clears throat> again, just because you see something, a methodology, a piece of technology used out in the industry and you've seen it used badly, doesn't mean that technology is great. I've fallen into this with React. I've seen a lot of interesting React code bases uh, with questionable architecture with build times that take you know several weeks when you hit save and then you try and reload it again and for a while i was like yeah react sucks but really react isn't the issue um react does its job really the bad architecture was the issue really the bad build tools were the issue and just because this guy's seen horrible tests that strangle a code base i don't think that's a great reason to throw out tests and i would encourage him to learn testing you know from some of the great books about it out there or some of the um great proponents of it out there and maybe see if he changes his mind because i think he might find his life is a lot easier if he learns how to do some good old-fashioned tdd all right that's it for this video thanks very much for watching